Now, I suspect that as you saw the title of this morning's message, Cowardly Denial, your hearts did not jump for joy. <laughs> this isn't something like, you know, 10 ways to find hope in God or something, you know, something like that. It, it, it sounds very, I don't know, oppressive or dark. Uh, it, 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 it approaches us with a, with a certain challenge. These words, cowardly denial. That being said, the Bible does speak about cowardice and about being a coward. It speaks about it in a number of places and about, or cautions us against, denying our faith. And the reason why the Bible speaks this way to us and mentions these things is because as Christians, we are not of this world. Jesus said it himself, actually, in this gospel, in John 15 and verse 19. Jesus says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore, Jesus says, the world hates you. Those are strong words. The world hates you. From the perspective of the Bible, of course, the cowardly are not those who for example, are scared of heights. You know, from a worldly perspective, it's like, oh, you're afraid of heights, you're a coward. Or maybe afraid to ride a roller coaster. Uh, or f- afraid of, I don't know, things that go bump in the night. You know, that, that's what the, the worldly, the world kind of looks at cowardly people that way. But that's not exactly how the Bible speaks about cowardice. The cowardly in the Bible are professing believers who yield under the world's pressure. Daryl Harrison, one author, author, he defined the cowardly as those so overcome with fear and timidity in a given situation that they equivocate, they dodge, they evade, they hesitate on the truth, or, he says, they deny it altogether. So the Bible means when it talks about the cowardly. Now, it's likely you've experienced uh, a given situation in which you're tempted to act cowardly about your faith. Friendships oftentimes present these situations. Social gatherings, family gatherings, workplace encounters, conversations tempt us to equivocate or to deny our faith. Even further, we know that the the price of nonconformity is high. Being courageous about our faith is going to come at a cost We sense that, and so we hesitate with our faith. Again, the words of Jesus. If they persecuted me, well, what does Jesus say? They will persecute you. So again, the cost is high. Now, for whatever challenges that the world throws at us, Scripture is clear that you and I have been divinely equipped to stand against the threats of this world. We've been given the strength to, in the words of Scripture, overcome the world. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. For everyone who has been born of God, believers, everyone who has been born of God, been born again, born from above, Jesus, John says, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And so each of us has been uh, spiritually equipped to stand against this temptation of cowardice. In other words, we don't have to yield to the world's pressures to conform. We can stand against the world's values, the world's social norms, as Paul encouraged the younger Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Now this morning, as we study, continue to study the Gospel of John and look at John 18 in particular, we're going to look at arguably the most descriptive picture of cowardly denial found in the Bible, as we've already mentioned in our worship service, Peter's denial. We're going to study Peter's denial. And what makes this denial especially distinct, especially uh, notable, is that the denial follows a confession of heroic allegiance. So it makes it kind of so stark 
is that Peter was, Peter was the one who, who, who claimed he would never deny Christ. You remember this from John chapter 13. Peter turned to Jesus. Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? And then he has that statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. He makes a prophecy there that in fact Peter is going to deny him not once, not twice, but three times. So this morning, here's the big idea for our text. We'll put it up on the screen there. A descriptive picture of cowardly denial calls us to act courageously for Christ. So that's my hope this morning that in looking at this denial, this cowardly denial, that we would be inspired, we would be encouraged, called upon to act courageously for Christ. Now, just to be clear, this descriptive picture is not one of Peter alone. We're actually also going to see the Jews that are also going to be in this picture. And so we're going to see the trial of Jesus and the denial of of Peter. The, The text is going to kind of shift back and forth from these two events. And so in this way, the picture of cowardly denial contains both a picture of Peter and the Jewish leaders. Now, though Jesus demonstrates his deity in the garden, which we saw that last week, you remember, Jesus claimed the divine name. He said, I am, and all of those soldiers bowed down uh, in, in response to that. In one account, we didn't read it in John, but you remember Peter cuts off the ear of the, of the man, and, and Jesus actually healed the man right on the spot. In spite of all of that, Jesus is still bound and arrested. And so we're going to see, as our text begins, this unjust arrest, the unjust arrest. This will be kind of our first point of our outline. Look down at John 18, verses 12 through 14, and we'll start there. Hear the word of the Lord, verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. You might remember that prophecy. Now in this text, John reports there in verse 13 that Jesus was first led to Annas. The trial before Annas was the first of uh, three Jewish trials. Uh, Not all of them are recorded in the Gospel of John, but Jesus will be on trial before Annas and before Caiaphas and then before the Sanhedrin. Some people conflate the the last two. So, you know, before Jesus, before Caiaphas and Sanhedrin, they count that as kind of one trial. But Jesus is effectively, effectively standing before three people, three Jewish trials, and he will also experience three Roman trials. Twice he will stand before Pilate, and then one time he will stand before Herod. He'll go to Pilate first, then he'll go to Herod, and then he'll go to Pilate again. Although John doesn't give us the story of Herod's trial. Now, Annas was the high priest from year 6 to 15 AD. He previously held that office, and so he retained the title of high priest, even though he wasn't actually the high priest in this year, and that is the year in which Jesus was crucified. But again, he retains the title of high priest, and so the text calls him the high priest. Annas was the immediate predecessor of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was his son-in-law. Caiaphas was the high priest, again, in this fateful year, the year of the text in which Jesus was crucified. That's what John is saying in verse 13 there. Now, up through 66 AD, Annas would have five sons serve as high priest, and so we could say that Annas really was kind of a, kind of a, a, he had a priestly dynasty in his family. And so it goes without saying, he was a very influential man. In fact, tremendously influential. And so we see here that he's taken, Jesus is taken first to Annas. Now, why would Jesus be taken to Annas first? Well, as we'll see in a moment, it's likely that this purpose was to attempt to force Jesus to incriminate himself. And so they're trying to force their hand and to get to draw Jesus out, to get him to say something. So then when they bring him to Caiaphas and the real high priest and the real trial begins, they'll have something to bring against 
Jesus. And so that's what they're doing here by bringing Jesus to Annas first. Now, John gives us this parenthetical statement in verse 14. He reminds us that Caiaphas had prophesied that it would be expedient for one man to die for the people. You remember that. Verse 14, it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. That was recorded back in John chapter 11 and verse 50. When we studied that, we, we discovered that the Jews saw Jesus uh, as a political threat to them because the people were following Jesus and he was stirring up riots. And, and the Jews really had their land kind of, you might say, almost kind of on loan from the Romans. The Romans were the real control of the land. And they thought, the Jewish leadership assumed that if there were riots and there were trouble, well, then the Romans would come in and take over leadership of that Judea, that region where the, the Jewish leaders uh, reigned. And so they thought they saw Jesus as a threat. And using this kind of political logic, Caiaphas comes to the conclusion that, well, it would be better if one man dies and we save our nation than for the whole nation to crumble. And so in, in saying that, really what Caiaphas is doing is the Lord is actually using Caiaphas to make a prophecy that Jesus, in fact, would come to die. And so John stresses that again here in John 18. Now in verse 15... The, the narrative shifts. As I said, it's going to go back and forth from the trial of Jesus to the denial of Peter. And so in verse 15, John shifts the narrative over to, uh, over to Peter. And in verses 15 through 18, we'll see Peter's first denial. And we'll call this the denial of association. The denial of association. Look down at verses 15 through 18. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, since that disciple was known to the high priest. Remember, they're following them to Annas' palace. He entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, verse 16, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Now as a side note, it is interesting that, as I mentioned, in, when you look at the synoptic gospels, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John, it, all of them contain information about the trial of Jesus and Peter's denial. But many of them leave out much of the trial of Jesus. But interestingly, they all give us the story of Peter's denial. Every gospel gives us the record of Peter, Peter's denial. And so it, it's kind of interesting to think about why is it that the gospel writers would dedicate so much space to Peter? Why leave out large portions of the trial of Jesus, but yet give us this account of Peter's denial? Now, I'm posing that question. I don't really know the answer. <laughs> Truth be told, I don't know. I didn't have a conversation with our Lord about that. Yet, it does seem to me that it's likely that the Lord just wants us to give us this picture of, of maybe why the cross is so needed. Why we need a Savior. And what better picture to give us than really the chief apostle. I mean, this is the number one man. This is the leader of the twelve who is essentially going to fall on his face here and deny our maker. And so what other way to demonstrate our need for a Savior than to show us this graphic picture of Peter's denial. Now we know that the disciples fled the scene after Jesus was arrested. Matthew 26 tells us that. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. It's kind of a prophecy that that would happen. And so all of the disciples uh, ran away from Jesus when he was rest, uh, arrested. However, as we, we just read, two of them actually stay with Jesus. And so two of the disciples follow Jesus, Peter and John. Now, you noticed as I was reading that, it doesn't actually tell us that John followed, right? It uses a, a, a different phrase there. John never uses his name in this gospel. 
And so it says, the other disciple. It's kind of a John's way of, I don't know, call it humility. I don't know what you might, might call it, but he never actually names himself in the gospel. He uses little phrases like this. And so I believe the one who's following Jesus along with Peter is, in fact, John. And so as I've said it, it's John and Peter that are following Jesus. Now, we also know that from the other Gospels that these disciples followed at a safe distance. They weren't with the crowd. And so you might imagine them kind of hiding in the background as Jesus was arrested and the the guards were up in front of them. Thus, Lenski says, love drew them to follow. Fear kept them at a distance. Now, that being said, apparently John was known, it says there in the text, he was known by the high priest. The high priest knew the other disciple. And so John had some kind of relationship with the high priest. Now, what that relationship was, we don't actually know because the text doesn't really say anything about that relationship. So we would just be speculating about what kind of relationship John had with the high priest. However, he was known by the high priest. And so he is entered in. the, the, the way I kind of see this all kind of happening is, is they're all going into the palace and they're all walking in there and, and John, you know, I don't know, he shows his badge or he shows his credentials and they recognize him and he just kind of goes through and then Peter kind of comes up and, you know, you get the guard that you kind of, he pulls the stanchion across and Peter can't find his way in. He, he's denied access. He doesn't have credentials to get into the palace. He stood outside at the door, the text says. Now, thankfully, Peter does have an advocate in John. And so then in that, the story there, John comes back out. He's like, oh, Peter didn't get in here. So he goes back out and they have a conversation. He speaks to the servant girl. The nature of the conversation, we don't know. I assume he's arguing there that, hey, let him in. You know, he does something to get the permission of Peter to come into the palace. And so Peter is then allowed to enter into the courtyard. This would be the courtyard where the pal Annas' house essentially was. So John's appeal was granted and it says there at the end of verse 16, Peter was brought into the courtyard. Now, as he's doing this, as he, as she, as he comes through the gate, you might say, in a very casual way, at least that's the way the text presents it, the, the servant girl turns to Peter and asks him a question. Are you also not one of this man's disciple? Or you also are not one of this man's disciples? Are you? It's an open question. The question comes casually. We even imagine kind of Peter is moving through the gate as the question comes. And so she asks, are you also a follower of Jesus? It's interesting there because the the question assumes, of course, that she knows that John is a follower of Jesus. You also. And so she already knows John's a follower of Jesus. John's an associate of him. And so she just casually asks the question, are you also with him associated with Jesus? And of course, how does Peter respond? He says, I am not. He denies association with Jesus. Thus we are given Peter's first denial. And we discover that it really only took a slave girl to bring the leader of the twelve to his knees. Gone is Peter's heroic pledge to lay down his life for Jesus. Gone is the courage to defend Jesus with the sword. Here we really see an utter coward, unable to confess his Lord, even to a servant girl. John provides the broader picture in verse 18. This kind of opens up the scene and we're, we're able to kind of see the bigger picture of what's going on. There in verse 18 it says, Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they, they, were, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also, it says, was with them standing and warming himself. So we have this broader picture of the palace servants, the temple, temple officers, likely those that actually arrested Jesus and brought Jesus there. They're all standing there out in the dark, warming, warming themselves by the fire. Now, Jesus spoke strongly about those who would deny him. You probably know that. You've probably heard some of Jesus' words concerning those who deny him. 
This is a very strong language. Jesus says, whoever denies me before men, you remember this, whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. <laughs> That's a really, really strong statement. I'm afraid of that statement. I don't know if you are. It's a scary statement. If we deny Christ, well, then he denies us before the Father. This is what Jesus thinks about denying him. Not only that, but Peter was also lying. So, Jesus, so Peter denied Jesus, and he also, he lied. He told a lie. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will not escape. Proverbs 19, 5. Both Peter's denial of Christ and this broader picture that we're given here in verse 18 reveal that something maybe that Peter was really trying to fit into the crowd. It's kind of the picture that we're given here is that he's with the crowd. He's with these people. And we know he's, he's already denied association with Jesus. He's, he's joined in their conversation. He's joined in their thinking. I think it's fair to say that this teaches us that when we try to blend in with the crowd, well, that only leads us to deny our Savior. As we've already said, we're not of the world. The, world, the only way that the world is going to accept us is if we're not followers of Jesus. As Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And so often, we, pre we pretend to not know Christ or we hide our faith. May it be that this descriptive picture of cowardly denial calls on us to act courageously when we're with our coworkers when we're with our friends, when we're at school, when we're at social functions, among our neighbors, even strangers, even our friends. May we act as Peter did in Acts chapter 4. You remember, of course, with the Holy Spirit, he acts with boldness. When they had prayed, it says, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. May the Lord give us strength as we study this denial to do as Peter would eventually do and speak with boldness. Now, in verse 19, I told you this sh the scene shifts back and forth. And so, in verse 19, the, sheen, the scene shifts from the courtyard in Peter's denial to the examination of Jesus within the palace. So, now we're back inside the palace with Annas. John records the first Jewish trial and what I'm calling the Jews' tragic denial. The Jews' tragic denial. This is verses 19 through 24. Let's look at those together. Again, verse 19, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Now, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with the hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, well, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As I previously mentioned, Annas was the high priest who questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. It seems the purpose of this questioning is, is again, to get Jesus to say something that they could use against him to incriminate himself as they take him to Caiaphas. Now, of course, all of this, as we know, is a mockery of Jewish justice. Just about everything they're doing in this account is breaking their own laws. So, for example, you think about the time. Well, this court is assembled at night. According to Jewish law, there is to be no cases tried at night. They're all to be tried in the day. You think about the place in which they're doing this. They're doing this in Annas', Annas palace. This isn't even in a, 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 a temp, or a, an official courtroom. They're not trying him in court. Furthermore, this is the, the Passover week. This is a holiday. They're not supposed to try any cases on a holiday week. And finally, think about the motive. The leaders aren't seeking justice. 
Really what they're doing is they're seeking to devise a charge against Jesus by which they could condemn him to death. And so the time, the place, the holiday, the motive, all of this proves that it's really a a mockery of Jewish justice. According to the Jewish law, it was the responsibility of the accusers to bring forth witnesses, not the responsibility of the accused to demonstrate their innocence. So in other words, what's supposed to happen is that there's supposed to be somebody out there who who says that Jesus did something wrong and broke the law, and then those witnesses are supposed to come to the leadership and tell the leadership, hey, he did wrong, he broke the law. They're supposed to listen to those witnesses and make a judgment. But there's absolutely no witnesses that are here. And so we see that come out in Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15. This is what the law says. This is what they should have followed. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. And then it says, only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. And so without such witnesses, we have the principle of presumption of innocence, which they obviously don't think he's innocent, right? (laughs) They should have believed and thought that he was innocent until he's proven guilty, but, but again, they don't believe he's innocent. They bring no witnesses. All they're trying to do is incriminate him to get something to use against him in front of Caiaphas. Now, Jesus draws this out in his response. This is really what he's responding to when he responds. And he responds forcefully. He responds forcefully to these Jews who wish to invent some charge against him. All the pronouns are very emphatic. Jesus is saying, I have spoken openly. I have taught in the synagogues and in the temple. There's lots of witnesses out there. My my teaching is public. I have said nothing in secret, Jesus is saying. And so Jesus is appealing to that public knowledge. He's appealing to those witnesses that would be out there to, to tell them about his disciples and about his teaching. And so in so doing it this way, as Jesus forcefully responds, really, Jesus is telling Annas that his course is wrong, right? He's telling him, you're doing the wrong thing. This is what you should be doing without saying it. What Annas should be doing is appealing to witnesses and to evidence, but he's not interested in doing that. If Jesus was some criminal teacher, surely his teaching would have done, been done in the shadows, but that's not the case. Jesus taught in public. He always taught in public and before the world. In fact, his teaching was so widespread that Jesus can easily appeal to Annas. Ask those who have heard me. Teach about my followers and teach about my, my doctrine. They'll tell you what I've said. His teaching was public property. Literally, thousands could testify to what Jesus had taught. In fact, I love the way John's gospel ends. You remember the very last verse of John's gospel in John 21 and verse 25. John tells us there, Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That's how much public knowledge there was about Jesus. So, I've spoken openly. Go ask anybody. They'll tell you what I taught, is what Jesus is saying. And in saying that, really what what Jesus is doing is he's putting his finger on the evil motives of Annas. He's exposing it just by saying what he says. If he really wanted to know what Jesus actually taught, he could have easily searched out such things. And so with with a forceful response, Jesus lets Annas know that he can see through his twisted pursuit of justice. In this way, Jesus questions the questioner. And he does so really in in a way that Annas has no answer. The only thing Annas can do is incriminate himself. And he does that really in the next scene. So it's clear that they, they, they are not going to respond to this. And so you see that in verse 22. They resort to violence. Verse 22. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with the hand, with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Now, in any other, again, in any other case, in any other time, this would be absolutely outrageous for a man to strike someone who is giving testimony in an actual courtroom. This would never happen. It's, it's, a, 
it's really a, just a, a horrible thing that this is happening. But, but again, all the regulations of any real court have been removed. And so they're breaking all kinds of ru- rules here. Now, the word that, that John uses there, uh, strike, uh, in the ESV it's translated, uh, is, is really a, it's with an, it's a, a blow with an open hand. And so it's not a punch, it's a slap, which I would imagine is, is just as shameful as, as it is in our day. It's, a, it's really a shameful act that he would, you know, slap Jesus across the face and then speak these words. And he, he, had, he had justifies, of course, that, of course, that slap by saying, is that how you answer to the high priest? Now, in, in this account and seeing this, I, I do think there's a lesson here for us. Uh, namely, when we're confronted with someone or something we disagree with. Do we pursue dialogue and discussion or do we denigrate and disparage as we see has happened here? Well, we're likely, while we don't likely resort to physical violence, I don't think you would, I, I hope I would not, we might engage in what's called an ad hominem or a, a personal attack against someone. An ad hominem is a, is a logical fallacy in which we direct our argument against a person instead of the position that they hold. So that's essentially kind of what's happening here, except, except they're resorting to violence, right? They're not responding to Jesus with his position by offering an excuse or reason for, for their actions. They just resort to violence and they slap him. Well, this ad hominem or this attack of, of a person's, of the person and not their position is what the Jews always did. They always resorted to this. You remember in John chapter 8 and verse 28, Jesus made the claim there. That, before, that the Jews and their actions proved that they were sons of Abraham, that they were not sons of Abraham, but sons of the devil. Your father is the devil by your actions. And the Jews didn't respond to that position by giving them an argument. What they, what they did was they said, you're a Samaritan. You're Beelzebub. You're the devil. And so they resorted to a personal attack against Jesus. You have a demon, they told Jesus. So this kind of insult, this kind of action is really the last resort for those who have no argument. As Christians, our goal should always be to dismantle arguments and not people. We should speak against positions and not people. As Paul says, 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 and 5, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to speak against evil, speak against what is false. Again, not people, but the position. When we fall victim to ad hominem attacks, we damage reputations and we eclipse the truth, which is exactly what's happening here. They're damaging Jesus' reputation for sure. I mean, they're going to crucify him. And they're eclipsing the truth. There's no room for the truth here. Their actions, their violent actions, eclipse the truth. Now, Jesus responds to the blow from the officer in verse 23. Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But what I said is right... Why do you strike me? Now again, in this response, Jesus exposes the the vicious motive of the officer's violence. Because they cannot prove the words of Jesus wrong, they resort to violence. And this is a really a a wonderful picture of uh, fulfillment, you might even say, of Jesus' words from Matthew 5, 39, where he taught, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, well... Turn to him the other also. Well, Jesus is showing us exactly what this looks like in this text. He helps us to interpret that verse. Notice what Jesus does and doesn't do. Jesus doesn't make any attempt to strike the man. Many people actually believe that Jesus would have been loosed from his his bindings, his ropes, and so he would have been sitting there. We don't know for sure, but there's no inclination at all that Jesus is trying to lash out or respond in a physical way. He doesn't do that at all. He turns the cheek. Of course, we know Jesus is perfect. (laughs) Yet, in turning the cheek, 
Jesus does do something. He rebukes the man for what he said, what he did, what he did, excuse me, for slapping him. In other words, I think there's uh, uh, something here that teaches us that we can distinguish between the mouth and between the hand. While we should hold back our hand against those who strike us, we shouldn't hold back our mouths against speaking evil. As Ephesians 5, 11 says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead do what? Expose them. We are supposed to expose evil. And so Jesus, Jesus does exactly that. He doesn't physically respond to the man. He doesn't lash out physically, but he does speak about what he did and that it was evil. He exposes evil. John reports no response from Annas or the officer. None is given here. Just that Jesus is essentially moved on and he is sent to Caiaphas. And so their attempts to get Jesus here to incriminate himself or to lash out or to do anything fails them. It's fruitless. And so they pass him off to Caiaphas. Now, John doesn't record it, but in one of the other gospels, when he moves to Caiaphas, that's when uh, the, the author tells us that they bring in those false witnesses. So they event eventually do bring in witnesses, but the gospel record tells us that they're actually false witnesses. They drummed up people that were going to speak lies against Jesus just so that they could try to fulfill the law in some ways. Now at this point, as I said, John decides to exclude the events surrounding Jesus' trial before Caiaphas. It's not recorded here in God, the Gospel of John. Instead, what John does is he shifts the focus back outside and we move back to Peter. And we're going to see in verses 25 and 27 his second and third denial. We'll call this final section the denial of discipleship. And so we had the denial of association and here we have the denial of discipleship. Now I mentioned earlier it's dangerous to mingle with the world and how that often leads us to deny our Lord. Well, we're going to only see that strengthened here in these verses. So look down at verse 25 through 27. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, this is the second denial, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. There's the third denial. And at once it says, a rooster crowed. Verse 25, Peter again denied association with Jesus. This is the second denial, as I've said. There's something else there in verse 26. They question him and they ask there, did I not see you in the garden with him? I think this, this, this question presses further than the previous questions and, and further than the servant girl's question. The question is more pressing because it suggests a deeper relationship with Jesus. Weren't you one of his close companions, his disciples, as I've kind of framed it? I mean, there were only 11 men that stood with Jesus in the garden. Weren't you one of those 11 men? Is essentially what they're asking. Weren't you one of the closest followers of Jesus? Aren't you one of his disciples? Now, what's Peter supposed to do at this point? He's already denied Jesus twice. One, one lie compels another, right? And so how's he going to undo this? How's he going to unscramble the egg? How's he going to go back and have to face the servant girl and face the crowds and face all these people and say, well, actually, I lied to you guys. I am one of his followers. And that's, that's really hard to do. That's going to take a lot of humility. And of course, we see, we know the story. Peter doesn't do that. And so with the third denial there in verse 27, the rooster crows and the words of Jesus have been fulfilled. Again, John 13, Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And so the words of Jesus are fulfilled. This is the way Jesus or John records these events for us. Luke's account, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's always struck me as the most compelling account of Peter's denial. Luke tells us in Luke 22, 
And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I find this just amazing. Sad and amazing. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And it says, and he went out and wept bitterly. It's a graphic picture given to us. Apparently, Peter's third denial came, well, just as the officers were moving Jesus from Annas' palace to Caiaphas's, the tr- where the formal trial would be. And as they're moving Jesus across the courtyard, there John is out in the cold over a fire with the crowds. And he's the, as the words, I am not his disciple, come out of his mouth, he catches the eyes of Jesus. And so there he is, not only denying Jesus to a servant and the temple guards and these other people, but he is denying Jesus to his face. It's a tremendous picture, really a a sobering picture of cowardly denial. There's a song that captures Peter's story. It's one of my favorite songs, and uh, the lyrics capture kind of the whole story of Peter from the upper room all the way through this cowardly denial. I'll read you the lyrics to the song. It starts in the upper room. Once again, these bitter herbs, the perfect complement to all your cryptic words. I nod, but don't know what to say, but I know you, and I believe you're who you say you are. So I, I will follow you. You remember Peter said this, I will lay down my life I will die for you this very night. Once again, the bread and the wine. But it seems the meanings may be deeper still this time. And you surprised me when you said I'd fall away. Don't you know me? I could never be ashamed. Not I. The song shifts then to that evening. I've never been this cold. The fire's gravity compels Like planets cling to soul, I feel my orbit start to fail. Like moths to a flame, I come too close, and all my oaths are burned. As stars begin to run, all my accusers take their turn. And calling curses down from my lips, lies like poison spill. And then that awful sound, the sound of prophecy fulfilled. And then I meet your eyes, and I remember everything. And something in me dies the night that I betrayed my king. It's a graphic picture of cowardly denial. Now it's tempting, of course, to study Peter and to think about Peter and to only see these truths, these realities in Peter's life. To only see him through this lens of betrayal. To allow this descriptive picture of cowardly denial to shape our perspective on Peter. One commentator, William Barclay, he suggests something different when he writes. It was the real Peter who protested his loyalty in the upper room. It was the real Peter who drew his only sword in the moonlight of the garden. It was the real Peter who followed Jesus. He followed behind, but he still followed when all those other apostles fled. It was not the real Peter who cracked beneath the tension and who denied his Lord, Barclay suggests. And this is just what Jesus could see. I'm not sure exactly what Jesus saw when he looked into the eyes of Peter. But I do know that Jesus gave Peter an opportunity to redeem himself. And we know that. The Gospel of John records that in the resurrection, Jesus went, having been resurrected, he went to Peter and he asked him, not once, not twice, but three times, do you love me? And so Peter had that wonderful opportunity to stand before the Lord, before Jesus, and to look into his eyes again and say, Lord, you know I love you. And to confess his undying love to Jesus. Here's a quote from Charles Spurgeon that I love. Spurgeon says, Do not judge a man by any solitary word or act. 
Man, that's good, good advice. <laughs> Thank you, Spurgeon. <laughs> Do not judge a man by any solitary word or act. I'm thankful for that. And he continues, For if you do, you will surely mistake him. Cowards are occasionally brave, and the bravest men are sometimes cowards. It's helpful. Now the title again, Cowardly Denial. It might, have, might not have brought a smile to your face as we began this message. What ought to bring a smile to your face is this. Cowardly denial does not define you. Amen. And it does not define me. Amen. It did not define Peter. Because our identity, who we are, is found in Christ. We are in Christ. He is our identity. Amen. And he is the one that was never cowardly. He stood against all things. He never once denied his father. He went all the way to the cross, gave his life, never denied Jesus. And so being in him, I have my identity in him. And through the power of his spirit, he gives me strength to stand courageously for him today and tomorrow. I want to end this morning simply by just reading some scripture. I just want to read some passages of scripture. And you can write the addresses down. The, you can write them down if you want. And when you feel cowardly, maybe you can go and pull these up and read them. And hopefully they will be an encouragement to you. So just a series of scriptures I want to read to you as we close. The first is Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamped against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. How about First Chronicles 28.20? 20? These are some of the last words David spoke to his son Solomon. Again, First Chronicles 28.20. 20. Be strong and courageous and act. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. We know Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. How about 1 Corinthians 16, 13? Be on the alert. Again, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? I just love that the psalmist says, when I am afraid. I love that. I don't know what song that is, but I love that the psalmist says and acknowledges that I'm afraid. Because I am afraid. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, it says, whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust. Therefore, I shall not be afraid. And finally, Psalm 31, 24. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. May this descriptive picture of cowardly denial call us to act courageously for Christ. Amen.